Welcome back to Cath Lab Outreach. My name's Scott. This week we're going to talk about electrical therapies. So if you were able to take an EKG, which we can from biology class, we can take an EKG of an individual ventricular cell. This is what this EKG would look like. The surface EKG is just a conglomeration of all of these vectors, all of this electrical activity, making it to the surface and all going in the vector that it's headed. What you have here is four drifts up to the threshold. Uh, when it hits that threshold, phase zero fires, which roughly corresponds with your QRS. And then phases one, two, and three are, are everything resetting or repolarizing. So the phase zero roughly correlates with your QRS and your QT duration is really impacted by phases one, two, and three. So during this, we have a, an effective refractory period. That means that uh, this is what the cell cannot respond to uh, other, other signals. In the EP lab, we get this measurement all the time. It helps, them, helps the EP doctors understand what's going on with the uh, different arrhythmias that we're finding in the lab. Uh, but with this effective refractory period, uh, we're talking about the time that it cannot respond to other signals. Remember, on that cell membrane, those electrolytes switch sides, and then it takes time for them to respond. So it's really broken down into two parts. You have an absolute refractory period. Right here, it cannot respond. This, the electrolytes have not switched sides. There's no response available. Uh, you can tell it to shock all you want to or to respond all you want to. During the, effect, the relative refractory period, some of the cells are reset and some are not. We use refractory period or we see refractory period all the time. We just don't really think about it in that regard. Here's a run of the mill PVC. If this person's heart rate is uh, 60, which would make sense it's, if it's a thousand millisecond cycle length, meaning from here, P wave to P wave, uh, you divide the cycle length, the number of milliseconds between the two marks you're measuring, divide that into 60,000, and that will give you uh, the heart rate. Uh, so here we can kind of prove that because here's two P waves and the, the, the distance between these two are 2000 milliseconds. And we see also that uh, during that PVC, there should have been another uh, P wave. Well, there was, we just don't see it because of the QRS from that PVC, but where's the response to that? Well, it can't respond because it's refractory due to the PVC. So we see this come up all the time. Uh, that's a compensatory pause that you see there uh, because it, it can't respond. And a lot of times after your PVC, your next heartbeat, if you were measuring your, art, your arterial waveform uh, for your pressure, you'd actually see a, a big in, increase in that, mainly because it's had time to fill more and you have a larger kick. So here when we talk about our QT, uh, there's some easy ways, you know, you get QT corrected and that, that number will spit out for you, but you, you really want to, uh, you can do this by just looking at your EKG and some quick math on this. Uh, the QT should be less than half of the previous R to R length or cycle length. And the reason you take into that previous R to R is that helps you factor in heart rate. That cycle length is going to change. You get smaller, the faster that heart is beating. So uh, taking that into consideration, it will still give you the, the right uh, relationship of that. That The longer that QT segment is, it's kind of a landing zone. So the longer that QT segment is, the more opportunity for a signal to fire inside of there, giving us that R on T phenomenon where that person can go into VFib. So here's an example. You look at this uh, QT and that T wave really uh, strung out there. I uh, hear this when, when you measure this, uh, the QT is 480 milliseconds. So is that long or not? Well, let's go back to the heart rate here. When you go back to that previous R to R, it's 680 milliseconds. So half of that is 340. So as long as the QT is shorter than 340, we're okay. This one's 480. That's a long QT. The long QTs can be congenital. We can alter it with some drugs. We can alter it with uh, some different electrolyte problems. Uh, here you look at the Zofran is on here. How much Zofran, Zofran do we give in, in the ERs on the ambulances? 
And we, we don't measure it in milliliters, we measure it in gallons. So here's a drug that seemingly benign, hey, this take care of their nausea, but we could be extending that QT even longer if we see that long QT uh, syndrome that they have. But you know, we, how often do you get an EKG before you give uh, Zofran? But not a bad thing to look at. And here you can actually just on uh, any EKG, you could look at it very quickly, get you an idea of if, if, if that's a problem for this patient and know if it's safe or not to give that. So there's some drugs and some things that can put in uh, effective refractory periods, but what can we do about that? Well, we can do that with electricity. And here's some rhythms that we, we would see that in, and we'll call it synchronized cardioversion or defibrillation, but really what we're talking, talking about is, is an effective refractory period that we're going to place into that rhythm to take care of that patient. So remember, it, the, the synchronized part goes with uh, unstable tachycardia, and we want to synchronize it because that will prevent the energy from being delivered on a, that a T wave. In the cath lab, back when we used to test uh, defibrillators more frequently, uh, one of the ways that the pacemaker app could actually cause V-fib to test the defibrillator is the R on T phenomenon. So it is a real thing, and if you drop that right on the right uh, at the right time on the T wave then that person will go into V-fib. That was the way we tested those things. So synchronized cardioversion, we remember it's for unstable tachycardia. We'll cover that here in just a second. One of the nice things you want to do is, is camouflage the fact that you're getting ready to electrocute them. Uh, you know, you'll hear people say, well, their blood pressure is too low. Well, we're getting ready to fix that. So those are different arguments for that. But to me, sedation is a kind thing to do. And remember, you don't even have to have your patient hooked up to an EKG before you know which, which algorithm you're in in ACLS. You feel their pulse, it's too fast to count, you know you're, and they're unstable, you know you're already heading toward the tachycardia algorithm. The fact they're unstable says, hey, we're going straight to cardioversion, straight to electricity. Remember, uh, when you have an unstable AFib or an unstable, or AFib would be the RVR, the rapid ventricular response, and they're unstable, or uh, a flutter and they're unstable, which is pretty rare. Uh, that chance, that that idea to defibrillate or to shock that to synchronize cardioversion that is a is a big decision. That's a risk versus benefit decision because you run the risk of causing stroke. The other thing about this is there should be two hints. One should say it should say synced, and then it should also have some type of marker for your R wave. Remember, when you do this, you don't want to let go too quickly. I see a lot of people, uh, especially new people in the cath lab, you know, that first time they'll just push and let go. That works for defibrillation, does not work for synchronized cardioversion. It will not deliver that energy until the button's pushed and one of these markers come through. So hold that button until you see that patient respond. Pad placement, uh, all the studies say that uh, the best place for that is anterior, posterior. Here's kind of a unique thing. You know, when you're talking about cardioverting something like AFib or flutter, you're actually trying to talk, get more of the atria. So here they talk about even positioning that and that anterior pad a little more to the right and up to make sure you send that energy through the atria. So I don't know if it, I've seen it work uh, that differently. Your know, pad placement is a huge part. We see that coming into the cath lab. You'll see patient, p patients with pads just kind of slapped on and the shoulders are ready to be defibrillated or their kidneys ready to be defibrillated. Uh, for this energy to work, it has to go through the heart. So you want to make sure your pads are in the right place. If you have patients that are not responding to defibrillation or synchronized cardioversion, pad placement is a huge component. And then defibrillation is just uh, the, a massive effective refractory period put in uh, for your V-fib and your VTAC and you want to just stop all the activity, put everything refractory, and then hopefully everything starts back correctly. Bad placement for that. Remember, you'll, you'll see the uh, sternum apex uh, uh, location back when we used to have the paddles the, the, where we would put those. But still, if you're going to do that, your best opportunity is to put, the, put things anterior, posterior, because uh, that's your most effective pacing uh, position, and it's very effective for your defibrillation. Even for uh, cardioversion, there was a study done 
to see if if the sternum apex would work for cardioversion and on all the ones that it failed they switched to uh, sternum apex and got it on the first try uh, so so anterior posterior is by far a superior method for doing that all right i hope that was helpful and we'll see you next time